Good afternoon and welcome to the July Tuesday Topics meeting from the Topeka Shawnee County League of Women Voters. And I wanna say happy uh, Independence Day week to you. We have some meeting guidelines. We have that down pretty well. Uh, and we're almost, we're on the glide path to having real meetings starting just in um, September. So only one more Zoom meeting if all goes well. But uh, keep your audio muted, please. Uh, you might decide, um, you can decide whether you wanna keep your video on or off. Uh, we will have our questions and answers at the end of the presentation rather than during. Uh, put those in the chat box, please. If you got a friend who's having trouble, he or she uh, should email that address, connect at Topeka Shawnee County, tscpl.org for help. So uh, we had some kind of good news, bad news in the last couple of weeks. The good news, uh, the Potwin uh, parade organizers asked the League of Women Voters if they would like to be part of the 4th of July parade. And we said yes. Uh, some of us hadn't seen each other in the flesh for a year. So we had the fun of marching the parade. And uh, we got to illustrate that the League of Women Voters has a hundred year history of helping other people vote and actively participate in our democracy. Voting is a patriotic act. And here are a couple of us with Uncle Sam, who by the way, looks much younger than I thought he was. Uh, our bad news was, which all of you have probably read about, that um, new laws making it harder for ordinary Kansans to vote and that call into question our basic mission of informing and assisting voters were passed in the last legislative session. It's ironic that um, a questionable law passed by the Kansas legislature kept us uh, patriotic parade people from handing out information about how to register and vote in the upcoming municipal elections. Instead, we were passing out candy. But our message, message remains clear. Voting in America is a patriotic act. You may have heard the NPR story uh, that's aired recently uh, saying that all the voter rights groups say the new Kansas law against impersonating election officers is incredibly vague. If somebody mistakes you for one, it's a felony. The lawyer representing us uh, made the point that uh, the new law probably will scare volunteers from helping with voter registration drives. It is ironically a misdemeanor if you want to impersonate a police officer, but a felony if someone thinks you're um, impersonating an election official. Last week, the State League asked us and the other eight Kansas Leagues to temporarily suspend all in-person voter registration activities till the district court uh, reaches a decision about a request for a temporary injunction on the part of the law that makes it a felony to seem to be impersonating an election officer. The new law's scope needs to be clarified. We're still very optimistic that we'll be able to go back to normal work soon and our voter services chair, uh, she's gonna love this. Here's a picture of her working at the parade is gonna give us a little more information about what's happening now. Um, I, we have several guests today and I wanna say welcome and thank you for joining us and uh, join us anytime. We have several new members. I may not have caught everybody. I noticed Susan Quinn, uh, was a new member last year and Patrick Woods, they're friends uh, and um, um, they are pretty new members. Melissa Masoner is like this weekend new member. Um, uh, Mary Monzek, um, Veronica Padilla, Catherine Richardson, Olivia Higdon, Olivia is here, are all new members. So uh, we're so happy to have you uh, with us. Uh, I'm going to ask for a couple of announcements, and uh, we'd like to start with voter services. Mary? Yeah. Um, thank you, Carol. If I can get my notes up here, I'll know what I'm going to say. Um, uh, voter services right now, uh, notwithstanding the um, 
the, the problems we have with the new law is currently making plans for the school programs for the fall. So if you have volunteered in the past for the school program, um, you'll be contacted shortly um, a, to see if you're interested in continuing. If you haven't volunteered for the school program in the past, but are interested in doing so, contact voter services at gmail.com. And we will get back to you and sort of explain what that school program is all about. Uh, you'll be seeing more about that in next, um, in the, not this coming voter, but the one following. Um, if you've signed up to participate in the league's um, July 27th community discussion, Democracy and Women's Rights in America, be sure to read the material. Um, if you registered for, to participate, you received uh, an email with a link where you can download um, the reading material. Registration for this discussion is closed, but we're planning another one to be held in the spring. It will be a different topic, but um, same, uh, same approach. So watch your email for that invitation uh, this spring. And as you saw in the announcement for today's meeting, the League has partnered with Sertoma in the Great Topeka Duck Race fundraiser. Proceeds raised by the League's team will support the League and other charities designated by Sertoma. It's fun, it's easy, it's for a good cause. There are prizes, what's not to like? the link and the instructions were in today's invitation. So Madam President, that's it from me. Thank you. I'll go buy ducks right after our meeting. Uh, one thing that I didn't put on our uh, announcements is the league is going to be co-sponsoring a candidate forum. And uh, Grace and I are both on that um, committee with folks from the Advocacy Committee of YWCA. And, uh, we just uh, tied down the date for that. That will be September 28th at the library. Yeah, that's a good sign here. So um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker today. And uh, he is a distinguished guy. And I've just heard from the grapevine that he's a great professor too. So uh, he's from Wichita. Friends University, has a bachelor and master from Brigham Young University, and then he earned his doctorate from the Catholic University of America. Uh, he's an expert on urban and local democracy, and he's a keen observer and commentator about politics in this state of ours. So please uh, join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Russell Fox. Thank you very much for that introduction. I uh, always enjoy uh, being able to speak to different civic groups. I, I particularly enjoy being able to speak to uh, you know, groups like yourselves made up of, of people that are, are interested in, in our civic culture, that are interested in politics and government, and uh, that bring with your interest, um, if I might, you know, be delicate, a, a certain amount of age and experience. Uh, I just got out. I, I, I just got out of three hours of my uh, American government class with, you know, a bunch of uh, 18, 19, 20, and 21 year olds. And I love college students. This is my career. I'm committed to it. But um, man, we're stupid at that age. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to be able to reach out to people that uh, have seen a little bit more and have thought a little bit more and, and maybe have a greater appreciation of some of the stakes that are present in the things that we argue about. So thank you for the invitation. And I hope this will be a fun hour. Uh, I am going to keep my presentation relatively informal uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to make this too much of a lecture, uh, but I'm, I'm going to try to run through some uh, points that hopefully will be of interest to many of you. 
And then I, I, I look forward to mostly being able to respond to your questions and, and maybe build on some of your comments. Uh, because along with the fact that you bring with yourself, uh, you know, perspective and experience and, and concern, uh, as members of the League of Women Voters, you are, almost all of you, I assume, paying attention to things that will allow you to uh, add some information to what I present, uh, maybe challenge some of the things that I suggest, and, and, and most of all, get some real productive conversation going. So. Um, let me uh, just move into my, uh, my presentation by way, first of all, of providing you with my thesis. I believe that voter suppression in the United States today is real and is mostly taking place in areas and in ways that are different from the areas and ways that are attracting the most media attention and that unfortunately are attracting uh, some of the most uh, energy and the most, uh, you know, the, the, the most enthusiasm uh, on the part of the sort of people who care about this. Uh, that's not to suggest that you know everybody who is out there fighting voter suppression is misdirected, uh, but I do think that there is a little bit of misdirection going on, and I think that that is something to be aware of. Okay, so um, in order to frame my thesis, uh, I'm going to uh, lay out a bit of history, much of which is is probably quite familiar uh, to many of you, but I, I think it's important to establish a context. So first of all, um, the uh, crucial facts about voting in the United States, uh, the way it works and the place that it holds within our system of government uh, begins with recognizing the federal nature of our elections. We are a federation. Uh, we are a federation of 50 different states uh, and one national government. Now, our federation is uh, far more centralized than many federations around the world. Uh, the state governments in the United States of America do not have the same authority. They don't have the same power of you know, for example, uh, the provincial governors in the country to our north, Canada, okay? Uh, uh, Governor Laura Kelly has significant authority, but relative to the president of the United States, relevant to the national government in Washington, D.C., uh, she does not have as much power as, say, for example, the provincial governor of Ontario has in regards to the Canadian national government in Ottawa, all right? Um, you know, it, federalism is a sliding scale. There are countries that have federal bodies where those federal bodies have almost no power. Uh, an example is the country to our south, Mexico. Mexico, strictly speaking, is the United States of Mexico. There are Mexican states with Mexican governors. Uh, but those governors have far less power than Governor Laura Kelly has here in Kansas. Uh, the constitution of the state of Mexico deprives them of that power. Uh, you know, the Mexican president can actually fire state governors and replace them with governors of their own choosing. That obviously is not possible under the US constitution. So. Uh, our federation is less federal than some, uh, but quite a bit more federal than others. One way in which federalism in the United States is very strong is in regards to elections. Elections have, <clears throat> elections have from the beginning been run by the states in accordance with state laws, and there have been real struggles when the national government 
for different reasons has seen it necessary to weigh in on the way that states run their elections. Throughout the history of the United States, the elective franchise, that is the right to vote, the people who are included uh, in the right to vote, has consistently expanded. So uh, at the very beginning, <coughs> excuse me, at the very beginning of the United States, uh, in order to vote, you had to be in nearly all of the states, a white male property owning citizen. In some of the states, you had to be a member of a Christian church or even the correct denomination of a Christian church. Almost immediately, uh, certainly beginning with the presidency of Thomas Jefferson and, consider, and continuing through the 1810s into the 1820s and the 1830s, state after state got rid of the property and the religious restrictions on voting. Uh, there's a couple of different ways in which we can think about this. Uh, we can think about it in terms of uh, a gradual shift that took place in the consciousness of most Americans. A, a lot of Americans came out of the Revolutionary War, they came out of the arguments over the US Constitution, and they still held to what I guess you could call classical Republican ideas. Uh, and I'm talking about Republicanism, not in reference to the Republican Party, but to the ideology. So this is small r Republicanism, not capital letter R Republicanism. Classical Republicanism assumed that there would be a kind of a, a strong aristocratic presence that would balance out uh, the democracy of the masses. Um, and you can see elements of that in our government. You can see elements of it in like, for instance, the US Senate, which originally was not elected. Members of the Senate were appointed by state governments. Uh, you can see it in the lifetime uh, tenure that not just people on the Supreme Court have, but all members of the federal judiciary have. Uh, so this, this, this very Republican idea that uh, there would be a, a, a popular, a place for popular energy, but there would also be kind of aristocratic controls over that energy, that began to fade almost immediately. It began to fade with the establishment of, of political parties. It began to fade with the demographic changes that you saw in the United States as uh, people moved into the West, uh, you know, all the way to the Mississippi River and began to expand, uh, you know, along the St. Lawrence Riverway and along the Mississippi River. Um, what you had basically were new people arriving in America, people that were poor, people that weren't members of uh, the existing churches. And they wanted to be able to vote. And political parties saw an advantage of being able to round up those voters. And so state after state got rid of the property restrictions and the religion restrictions. The next big expansion, of course, was race, because the only uh, people that could vote would be white males. Uh, after the Civil War, you had amendments added to the Constitution. The 13th Amendment uh, ended slavery. Uh, the 14th Amendment guaranteed equality. The 15th Amendment guaranteed the right to vote to all men, uh, regardless of race or color. And while this was obviously directed towards former slaves, uh, it wasn't long before people began to see in the 15th Amendment a defense of the right of, say, Native Americans to be able to vote, uh, the right of Chinese and Japanese immigrants in California to be able to vote. So that was a major expansion. That expansion was kneecapped by a variety of laws, what were called the Jim Crow laws that were established across the American South uh, that found ways to prevent uh, freed blacks and uh, the children of slaves and the grandchildren of slaves from being able to exercise the franchise, from being able to exercise their right to vote. Um, and this, of course, was central 
to the civil rights movement in the 1950s and the 1960s as people push to get rid of those Jim Crow laws and allow people to exercise their constitutional rights. The next great expansion, uh, I'm sure dear to the heart of many of you, was the 19th Amendment, uh, which uh, made it illegal for states to prevent women from voting. There were some states that had allowed women to vote in some elections. Uh, Kansas was one of them. But by and large, uh, women did not have the right to vote. And the 19th Amendment mandated that women would have that right. Uh, the 26th Amendment in 1971 established a uniform national rule for how old you had to be to vote. Uh, a lot of states already allowed people to vote at age 18, but some states had it at 19, some states had it at 21. Uh, the 26th Amendment required all states to set their election laws to 18 years of age. Those are the big expansions that most people think of when they talk about the right to vote and how that right to vote uh, became at least on paper available to more and more Americans. But there are two other really important pieces of legislation that are in fact central to the argument over voter suppression today. There is very little voter suppression that is obviously and formally directed towards preventing uh, people from voting on the basis of race preventing people from voting on the basis of sex, or preventing people from voting on the basis of age, uh, much less preventing them from voting on the basis of property or religion. I mean, uh, that sort of thing is essentially non-existent in the United States. But what you do have are ways in which different discriminatory practices have effectively, if not formally, but nonetheless effectively, gotten in the way of people being able to exercise their right to vote. And central to understanding the fight against that kind of voter suppression, that kind of discrimination, are a couple of Supreme Court cases and a very important law, all of which came down in 1964 and 1965. The court cases that I'm thinking out are court cases that not very many people uh, are familiar with, though perhaps some of you are. Uh, Reynolds v. Sims, uh, Webster v. versus Calarina. Uh, these are court cases that were handed down by the Supreme Court in 1964 that basically required states to follow the same pattern as the of the House of Representatives when it, as the Constitution stipulates, engages in redistricting following every census. There were a lot of states that didn't engage in redistricting when it came to state districts. There were a lot of states that simply invested counties with uh, voting authority when it came to drawing districts. These Supreme Court decisions laid down a principle that actually had never been verbalized before. That was the idea that the right to vote, as reflected in the 15th Amendment, was also subject to the equality clause that was in the 14th Amendment. In other words, votes had to be as much as possible of equal value to each other. One person, one vote. That's the phrase. And a lot of people you know, think of that as just kind of a general democratic principle, but it wasn't a general democratic principle until the 1960s in the United States. The idea that it is the responsibility of state governments to make certain that all of their voters have the ability to cast ballots that are functionally the same as all of the other votes that are cast in that state, all right? Then, of course, there is the Voting Rights Act of 1965. 
The Voting Rights Act was a very important piece of legislation that required states that it had a history of these Jim Crow laws that had prevented people from registering to vote or made it hard for people to register to vote to send whatever laws they write to Congress for Congress to review them. This was called pre-clearance. Any election law in those states uh, to scrutiny um, had to receive the approval of Congress before they could go forward. Uh, there were actually two components to this pre-clearance. They're referred to as Section 2 and Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 is the, uh, is the one that actually spells out the procedure for pre-clearance. Section 4 is the one that spells out the rules that determine what that pre-clearance would be based upon. All right. So having established that foundation, what do we actually see going on in the United States today? Well, what we have seen over the last 50 years, uh, or more than 50 years, because these innovations really began with the Supreme Court cases that I mentioned and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, over 50 years now. Over the last 50 plus years, you have seen state governments in their efforts to satisfy the preclearance requirements uh, of Congress in order to satisfy the requirements of a uh, one person and one vote, engage in a fair amount of experimentation. You have had changing laws in regards to voter identification, changing laws in regards to ballot access, changing laws in regards to mail-in ballots. And some states have taken these experiments in a much greater direction than others. So of course you have uh, some states in the Western United States that have had nothing but mail-in ballots for their elections uh, with very, very few polling stations where people can vote in person. And those are restricted to people who have you know, very uh, extenuating circumstances where you know, the mail-in ballot would work. Uh, all of this action on the state level has followed you know, different political incentives uh, they've responded to different concerns. And by and large, they have existed to try to make voting easier. Uh, not very much legislation has existed on the federal level. All of this stuff has been happening on the state level. You do have the motor voter law, which was passed uh, by uh, you know, uh, President Clinton pushed for this and it was passed uh, in the mid 1990s, uh, it was designed to allow people to register to vote at the same time that they get their driver's license. Uh, the idea was that if you make it easier for people to register to vote, they are more likely to vote. We have actually found out that, you know, that's not true. Uh, making voter registration easy does not automatically increase turnout. Turnout, voter turnout is a, a, a complicated creature. Uh, and it is made more complicated by the fact that you have political parties that want different segments of the population to vote, specifically the segments that are more likely to vote for them. And they want other segments of the population not to vote, specifically the segments of the population that are less likely to vote to them. Ever since the huge shift in the political parties in the wake of the civil rights movement, you have had a Republican party that by and large is not interested in expanding access to the ballot to uh, racial minorities and to poor people because they know that poor people and racial minorities tend to vote Democrat in larger numbers. And you have had a Democratic party that has responded to the Republican Party by fighting to expand access. All right, so you, those are the players 
and the states are the field in which all of these different struggles uh, over mail-in ballots, over voter ID, and other things have taken place. Over the last 10 years, the Supreme Court has handed down two decisions, one of which was just a few days ago, that have uh, just uh, exploded the terms under which these fights have taken place. One of them was the Supreme Court decision Shelby v. Holder in uh, 2013. Shelby v. Holder basically found that the preclearance requirement was an unconstitutional grab of federal of national authority away from the states, which are supposed to be running elections. Uh, obviously, that had never troubled the Supreme Court before. They had seen that the violations of the right to vote enshrined in the 15th Amendment that existed in these states was of great enough concern that it justified the national government taking responsibility away from the states, or at least taking a supervisory role uh, over what the states did. The Supreme Court, however, in 2013, uh, decided that no, this was a reach too far, uh, that um, the, enough water has gone under the bridge, enough time has passed that you know the violation of the right to vote on the basis of race is no longer the concern that it once was. And so Congress cannot claim emergency power to take power away from the states. And so the preclearance requirement goes away. However, the basic rules of the Civil of the Voting Rights Act remained in place. That is that if you can demonstrate some kind of discriminatory effect of a voting law, then that voting law would be in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Just a few days ago, the Supreme Court handed down Brovich versus the Democratic National Committee. This was a case that was looking specifically at some laws that had been passed in Arizona just very recently in the wake of the 2020 elections, okay? Those Arizona laws, I should emphasize, uh, are not the worst of all of the different state election laws that people worried about voter suppression are concerned about. Um, basically, it was a law that made it illegal for third parties to collect and deliver absentee ballots uh, to polling stations, um, and it was a, a law that uh, it was a law that uh, allowed election officials to simply toss ballots that are cast in uh, the wrong precinct, rather than flagging them as provisional ballots. Okay, um, you know this is the sort of thing that will affect the ability of hundreds of votes, possibly thousands of votes cast each year in Arizona to be counted. Legal votes cast by citizens, nonetheless disregarded because they were cast in the wrong precinct or because some person uh, found it more convenient or found it necessary to ask somebody else to deliver their absentee ballot. Um, these things were challenged under the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court found that challenge to be unconstitutional. They argued that this is entirely within the power of the state of Arizona to decide. In so doing, they basically voided Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because they are acknowledging that these laws, if they go into effect, will have consequences that are functionally discriminatory. Um, there's plenty of data to show that most of the people that might ask uh, uh, some third party to deliver their absentee ballot, or most of the people that might show up at the wrong precinct are people that tend to be poorer, people that tend to have less education. And in the state of Arizona, that often includes a lot of Native Americans, uh, a lot of second generation Hispanic immigrants, uh, it includes a lot of people of color. So it's functionally discriminatory. The Supreme Court has decided, well, just because some, in, just because some law has a discriminatory effect 
does not mean the law itself is discriminatory. And so they let that pass. All right, here's where we come around to my thesis. A lot of people will look at the laws in Arizona, and, or for that matter, they'll take a look at the laws that were passed in Arizona, oh, or they'll take a look at the history that we had fighting with Secretary of State Chris Kobach as he tried to impose uh, stricter voter ID laws uh, than was the case that had been established nationally. Uh, and you know, it tried to introduce some other uh, obstacles uh, to you know make it harder for people to vote. Um, there are a lot of important principles at stake in those fights that we had here in Kansas and, and are still having here in Kansas. There's a lot of important principles at stake in the laws you know that have been passed in Arizona and the laws that have been passed in Georgia. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of American citizens, possibly thousands of American citizens. This matters. However, in the broad view of things, when you're looking at things from 30,000 feet, when you are looking at patterns nationwide, there actually is not a lot of evidence that these sorts of laws, laws restricting the number of polling stations, laws restricting uh, you know, or shortening the deadline for applying for an absentee ballot, laws that require a specific sort of voter ID. There's just actually not a whole lot of evidence that that stuff is suppressing a lot of voting. There was record turnout in the election of 2020. Now you could argue that the election of turn the voter turnout in 2020 uh, was the highest that we've seen in a century, basically because everybody was so desperate to get out the vote in the face of this voter suppression that they were able to overcome it. Maybe that's so, but the fact of the matter is is that we did, in fact, overcome it. There was record turnout in Arizona. There was record turnout in Georgia. There was record turnout in Kansas. There just isn't a lot of evidence that these sorts of laws are suppressing a lot of votes, that they are suppressing electorally significant numbers of voters. Now look, if you're one of the hundreds or one of the thousands that get caught by these laws, the fact that <clears throat> excuse me, the fact that it doesn't turn out to be electorally significant may not matter. What matters is the principle here, the principle that is included, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the principle that is included in the 15th Amendment that guarantees the right to vote, the principle that was defended in the Supreme Court decisions that said every vote needs to be equal, one person, one vote. I would say, however, that there's something else to this story. And that something else is this. People focus on the ballot access rules. They focus on the voter IDs. They focus on the number of polling stations, all of which doesn't really seem to be affecting voter turnout a huge amount. What doesn't get the attention is the fact that a lot of these laws are transferring authority for making decisions about contested ballots away from local election officials. They're transferring them away from county election boards, and they are transferring them to the state secretary of state's office. They are transferring them sometimes to the state legislature itself. Now, voting has always been partisan. All of these fights about all of these state election laws have always been partisan. But a lot of these new laws are making them even more partisan than before. They are ensuring that partisan bodies, committees in the state legislature are gonna be the ones making decisions rather than election officials. That is the sort of thing that I think people should be deeply worried about. 
that is the sort of voter suppression that I think deserves our attention and our anger. Um, yes, the Georgia law that says that um, you're not going to be allowed to bring food or water to people waiting in line to vote is a horrible, stupid law. There also is plenty of reason to believe that in the long run, that's not the sort of law that's actually going to result in a whole lot of people saying, oh, the heck with it. I can't put up with this waiting in line. And they're going to go home and not vote. Some people surely will. But you're not talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. You're talking about fewer numbers of people. So the voter suppression that is happening, that a lot of people are fighting about, I'm not sure is actually, in the end, going to prevent that many people from voting. The voter suppression that is a happening and that I don't think enough people are talking about is a power grab by the Republican Party on the state level to make themselves the decision makers over what counts as a vote and who should be appointed to make those decisions. We have that here in Kansas. In Kansas, in all except four counties, people get to be able to choose their own election officials, the county commissions do. But four counties, the most populous counties in the state of Kansas, the Secretary of State gets to decide who the election officials are. Uh, here in Wichita, in Cedric County, a lot of us have enormous fondness for Tabitha Lehman, uh, our longtime appointed election supervisor, because she put up with a lot of, of hostility, she put up with a lot of controversy, and she has served the voters in Cedric County really well. She has also been fighting cancer. Because she has been fighting cancer and because of COVID, she did some of her work as uh, you know, the supervisor of the 2020 elections remotely from her home. Secretary of State, State Scott Schwab, a Republican, has decided that uh, Tabitha Lehman violated protocol and so he has removed her from her position. And he gets to a point who the new election supervisor will be. I think this is the sort of thing that we really need to be concerned about. Yes, Chris Kobach, you know, is a, a, a carnival barker and the stuff that he talks about is often very frightening. But there's not a whole lot of evidence that the stuff he's talking about in the end is gonna make a huge amount of difference. What isn't being talked about is the way that decisions about voting is being concentrated in political bodies. And that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of voter suppression that I think we need to be talking the most about. All right, that went on longer than I thought. Uh, I would love to take questions from everybody for the next 20 minutes or however, however long we wanna stick around. Does somebody wanna read them to me or can I just cherry pick the questions from the uh, chat room, or do people just want to shout out questions? How do we want to do it? I've asked people to put them in the chat room, and Mary Lou, I think, is going to read them. Okay. Okay. Go right ahead. Okay. So. Mary Lou, we can't hear you now. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Okay. We have one question at this point uh, in regards to the hodgepodge, quote unquote, of the states differently conducting voting uh, processes. Does that uh, impact how you have brought back, uh, brought about the voter suppression evidence? Yes, it does. And that is a wonderful observation and I appreciate someone making it. In the same way that the laws are uh, different in every state, you also have different procedures in every state for counting votes, for uh, reporting how many registered voters you have in a particular area, and so forth. And so it's actually very difficult to be perfectly certain about these things. Uh, so let me rephrase what I said before. We do not, in fact, have really conclusive evidence that 
uh, you know, like stricter voter ID laws or uh, limitations in numbers of uh, uh, voting booths or shortening the, um, the, the time frame through which people can ask for absentee ballots. We do not have really conclusive evidence that that has not had an electorally significant effect on the results. We do, however, have some pretty good evidence that it hasn't. That pretty good evidence mostly being the record turnouts of the 2020 elections, all right? So it is entirely possible that what we need to do is uh, we need to uh, do further studies and take a look at what happens at the midterm elections in 2022 and the next general election in 2024. Maybe it really is that we have serious declines in voter turnout, but for whatever reason, we didn't see those declines in voter turnout in 2020. Or it might be that some of these vote suppression laws have an attrition effect that you have the people that are really determined to vote who are willing to put up with the restrictions and overcome them at first. And then in the next election, you have fewer people that are willing to put up with it. The real election after that, even fewer people. So it, it, it might be revealed that in the long term, suppression is having an effect. All we can say right now is simply the people who look at these laws and say, look at the massive effect that they have had on voter turnout, they actually don't have a whole lot of evidence showing a massive decline in turnout, okay? So, but thank you for asking about the hodgepodge character of it. The second question is, is that uh, the youth vote increased, uh, was uh, increased 11% in 2016. In Kansas, the 2020 election saw voter youth vote increase to uh, 14%. What do you think is uh, the process there for increasing that vote or can be attributed to increasing that vote? Well, I mean, I think that uh, what, okay. Youth voter uh, turnout increased across the country uh, from uh, 20, uh, 12 to 2016 and it increased yet again from 2016 to 2014, though it didn't increase by the same amount relative to the baseline. I think that uh, the reason you are seeing increased voter turnout uh, amongst young people is first of all, because that baseline is so low. Historically, uh, voter turnout amongst young people has been the lowest of any age cohort. Consequently, any increase uh, is going to be significant, okay? And that significant will shrink as the number of youth voters, uh, you know, continues to expand, if it continues to expand. Another thing that we can attribute it to is simply the fact that uh, we have seen shifts in the youth consciousness. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to talk about this and a lot of different evidence that we can point to, but it is simply a fact that 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 year olds uh, of the 2010s are expressing themselves politically to, greater, to a greater extent than was the case in the 2000s. And it certainly was the case in the 1990s, okay? where you saw uh, youth voting turnout really hit bottom. So uh, you can attribute the better numbers to simply the fact that any increase is a big increase when you're starting so small and because you've seen greater political consciousness amongst young people. Now, what can we do to continue that growth amongst young people? It's an interesting debate. Uh, a lot of people lean hard on technology. They think that, uh, I mean, if we can find ways to make voting more amenable to the iPhone generation, that's going to increase voter turnout. I am actually kind of ambivalent about that. Um, I mean, technological solutions to me, you know, don't have a really great track record. Uh, when people, 
argued that when you can finally register to vote the same time you get your driver's license, that's going to change the game because everybody gets a driver's license, right? So everybody is going to become a registered voter and they're going to turn out to vote. Well, but we saw that that didn't actually make that much of a difference. Um, uh, I am much more interested in changes that really affect the way we live collectively as a people, like making election day a holiday or something like that. Um, you know, so it would have a huge impact on uh, jobs and schools and you know, the other sorts of daily responsibilities we might have. I, I'm actually much more interested in those sorts of reforms than reforms that say, ah, we can keep the kids voting if we, uh, you know, just make better apps for registering to vote uh, or, you know, uh, introduce new cool ways uh, for people to vote uh, individually. I mean, it would be an incredible achievement if you could actually get the states to agree to allow online voting. You think that something like that ought to be possible when you have people being able to make major purchases on a credit card by their phone, that people ought to be able to be able to identify themselves as a citizen and be able to cast a vote by phone. But the technological obstacles that stand in the way are pretty great. This next question follows up to just what you were talking about. It's if we can bank online, and we're assured that there's security with banking online. Why can't we vote online without a paper backup? And uh, if we could vote online, would paper backup really be required to ensure accuracy of voting? I mean, I guess the answer to that is it's technological, like I just said, but it's also legal. Um, your, your purchases, the banking that you do, is not constitutionally protected. Voting is constitutionally protected, which means that people who have an agenda can find a legal reason to challenge any kind of innovation uh, or challenge any kind of restriction and fight about it. You know, that's why things like Shelby B. Holder and Ravonich, the uh, Democratic National Committee, make it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, you know, I'm not uh, a, a real IT person, so I can't go in depth about the technological uh, restrictions. I can say simply this, we do not have a national ID, okay? The, you have social security numbers, the social security numbers are not built into the infrastructure of the 50 different state governments uh, to form kind of a, uh, a real identification purpose to play a real identification role, um, partly for privacy reasons, uh, and, but there are other reasons as well, having to do with the way states uh, keep track of their population. So, you know, the, the technological obstacles in the way of being able to identify yourself to some kind of, you know, election program and say, yes, I am this person, Yes, I do live in this place. Yes, I can cast this ballot. And then doing so are pretty great. Uh, the state of Kansas has passed a law that allows counties to order their, uh, uh, their polling stations to accept anybody's vote from anywhere within the county, okay? So like, like for instance, in theory, here in Sedgwick County, uh, students at Wichita State University who actually live, you know, uh, you know, out in Goddard or up in Valley Center, uh, they should be able to cast a ballot there on the Wichita State University campus and have it be counted. However, our Secretary of State, and, and this goes back to the whole idea about who's really making the decisions, our Secretary of State has refused to allow Sedgwick County to do it, saying we, we don't have the, the, the technology in place yet. Um, I would love eventually for it to get to the point 
where someone who is a citizen of a state should be able to cast a ballot anywhere within the state. But then again, I'm from Washington state originally, and I'd like actually to see universal mail-in ballots. Just mail out the ballots to everyone. I mean, it's worked in Washington state with very, very little incidents of voter fraud, um, but people fight against that for political reasons. One more question, Carol. Uh, Dr. Fox, can you explain why precincts with higher turnout rates also have higher income and often are more white than the low turnout precincts? I mean, this goes to uh, you know, some, some basic realities about voting in America and also just about human nature in general, okay? Um, if you live in a voter precinct, that has a higher average income, then that means that you are on average, probably someone with a higher income. And on average, the people with a higher income often have had more education. Uh, they often have more leisure time. They often have the sorts of jobs where you can take an hour off, uh, or they have the sorts of jobs that you know allow them to uh, knock off work early. If you have a higher income, you're more likely to have reliable transportation, so you don't have to depend upon public transportation. And uh, because of all of these things, because you have more disposable income, and therefore you have more say on the level of the state legislature, you have more influence over your state, the state legislators, uh, it's actually more likely that you have more polling stations than is the case in poorer districts. So for all of these structural reasons, all of which come back to education, they come back to participation, they come back to time, they come back to energy, uh, all of these things have an effect on uh, the availability of voting and the desire to vote. Um, I, there are places in Topeka, just like I am, I can tell you there are places here in Wichita where the average people that live in that district are poor, property values are low, levels of unemployment are high, uh, for reasons that automatically follow, uh, you have more people that turn to crime, which means that you have uh, more people that are struggling with drug addiction. You have more people that have a harder time holding down jobs, more people, people that have a harder time completing their education. And all of these things result in citizens that have less motivation to vote, that have less time to vote, that have less awareness of the rules of voting. And so therefore they vote less. Dr. Fox, I wish we could talk for another hour. We want I'm to sorry, thank you I'm so much. Too long. I apologize. No, no. <laughs> we have to. Do you have any online classes? We'll have to sign up. <laughs> At any rate, are oh, do you? Well, uh, well, I'm doing an American government class right now, but it's mostly in person. Let me shout out real quickly here uh, an answer to one question that I'm looking at here. Who are the decision makers who can change things in Kansas, making election voting decisions more or less political? Uh, the key person right now is the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State is, of course, someone who is elected separately from the governor. So uh, I think it's very interesting to look at that race. Uh, the Attorney General is also really important. And we have seen that Chris Kobach has thrown his hat back in the ring uh, to try to be elected state uh, uh, attorney general. Uh, beyond those people, of course, you know, you've got the governor. And then, of course, you have the majority of people within the state legislature. Um, you know, this is a multi-level fight. It happens on the county level and it happens on the state level. And uh, those are the places that we need to be directing our energy. Thank you very much. We all appreciate it. Thank you. We have to end our meeting. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it very much. You all have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks.